So far we have looked into um, the construction materials mainly the ceramic construction materials for example let us say cement or the products that we produce from cement. So cement is a ceramic material chemically combined then we have also looked into brick various kind of bricks they are all ceramic materials. Now in the module 11 we will look into metals and uh, these are another class of materials which are most commonly used in construction. You know you can hardly think of uh, any construction where uh, metal or alloys uh, most commonly rather steel is not used. So we shall see uh, metals in module 11 and in this first lecture of uh, module 11 first we will define metals and alloys. We will try to recall all the uh, basics that we have learned possibly in our earlier studies about metals and alloys. Then we will look into structures of metals, we shall look into deformation of metals, how the microstructure you know from the concept from the point of view of microstructure and then we will look into basically what are the strengthening mechanisms and discuss about this one or two of this mechanism today and rest of the rest of them sometime later on right. So what is metal? You know in chemistry a metal it derives its name from the word metallon is an element that readily loses electron to form positive ions <coughs> cations and has a metallic bond between metal atoms. You must be remembering the basic chemistry then there are certain elements which has got electrons in their outer shell which they can lose readily. So these elements are the ones metals and once they lose that those electrons they become cation and they have they form what is known as metallic bond between the metal atoms. Well we know that metal forms um, ionic bonds with non metals. For example, you know sodium chloride. Now sodium is a metal forms uh, sodium chloride with the non metal uh, chloride it forms ionic bonds and metal themselves are described as a lattice of positive ions surrounded by cloud of delocalized electrons. In, in case of uh, in chemistry we have learned then there are electrovalent electro you know electrovalent compounds there are covalent compounds or electrovalent bond covalent bond. The one of the classes of bond is the metallic bonds and this one you have a lattice of positively charged ions surrounded by cloud of dis delocalized electrons. So metallic bond is characterized by this we will look into this in a little bit more. Now if you see in the you know periodic table the metals are one of the three groups of elements as distinguished by their ionization and bonding properties along with metalloids and non-metals. Metals are metalloids are nothing but semi-metals and non-metals. So they are the three first three groups of elements distinguished by their ionization, ionizing and bonding properties along with metalloids and non-metals. Right. If you look at the periodic table, if you draw a diagonal line between boron and polonium, you know if I may say so somewhere in the northwest of the periodic table leaving first two groups out third one will be boron. If you remember it will be hydrogen, helium and the first group then you will have lithium, beryllium, beryllium and then boron. So from boron to polonium if you draw a diagonal it separates the metals from non-metals right. Most elements on this line are called metalloids you know they are semi metals basically and elements to the lower left are metals and elements to the upper right are non metals that is the uh, lower diagonal right are basically uh, elements are all metals and upper diagonal elements are non metals are non metals right. So that is what we can define what metals are. Now what is important for us are their properties, they tend to be lustrous, ductile and malleable 
we have some, made some discussion about what is ductility, but we will also define them today again if uh, possible. Then they are malleable and they are good conductors of electricity, also heat, while non metals are generally brittle, you know, they exhibit what is known as sudden failure. Again, we will discuss this. Of course, we are talking only of the non metal, solid non metal, and they are leg cluster and they are insulators. Usually, they are insulators. So, metals and non metals, this distinction distinctions are something like this. An alloy is a mixture of two or more elements in solid solution in which the major component is a metal, right. For example, okay, we will have some example, I mean you can have metal and non-metal as well or semi-metal as well in, uh, in alloys, but uh, one major component must be metal. So, they form solid solutions and uh, those are alloys. Most pure metals are either too soft, brittle or chemically reactive for practical use. You know, this is important. Most of the metals are, are brittle, soft or most important is chemically reactive for practical use. So, therefore, we combine different ratios of the metals as alloy to modify their properties and to produce desirable characteristics. So, that is what we do and that is what mostly we use alloys, right. The aim of making alloy is generally to make, make them less brittle. They would be ductile if we use pure metal. Rarely we use pure metal and uh, of course, pure metals are not stable themselves. Most of the metals leaving possibly things like gold or silver, but even then gold is usually not used alone. They are used together with something and of course, you know all other metals, we do not use them pure form, very rarely we use them pure form. So, <clears throat> by alloying we make them less brittle, make them harder, resistance to corrosion, resistance to corrosion or have a more desirable color and luster. So, that is the idea, that is what we do. Well, examples are alloys are obviously steel, which is an alloy of iron and carbon. We shall discuss more about this sometime later on. Brass and copper, brass and copper and gin, brass is you know alloy of copper and gin, bronze is copper and tin and duralumin used in aircraft is aluminum and copper. Alloy specially designed for highly demanding applications such as jet engines may contain more than 10 elements. So, they are specialized alloys. In civil engineering of course, most commonly used is steel and we will have more discussion on steel obviously, some uses of brass is also very much there. Okay. Uh, many metals actually possess, possess very high strength, structural strength, you know, very metals actually very many of them possess high structural strength per unit mass. This is an important issue, strength to weight ratio, strength to mass ratio and they are useful for carrying large loads and resisting impact damage etcetera. So, since since you know since uh, since they have high strength, they have high strength, so they can resist take very uh, quite a bit of high load and they can resist impact damage. Metal alloys can be engineered to have high resistance to shear, torque and deformation. However, the same metal can also be vulnerable to fatigue. You know fatigue of course, you have some properties not necessarily all properties some properties you can have high properties, higher high values, shear, resistance to shear, torque and deformation, but fatigue properties could be low, right. And uh, uh, that means, under repeated load which you have mentioned a little bit about concrete. So, under repeated load when they use them, they can fail at much lower load or impact load carrying capacity may be low depending upon the situation, depending upon the situation. Strength and resilience of metal has led to their frequent use in high rise buildings. So, that is what is most important, you know, uh, most important is uh, use of this ones in uh, high rise buildings. Commonly, they have been used in uh, high rise buildings, uh, they have been used in high rise buildings, and uh, 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 most commonly, they have been used in high rise buildings and bridge construction. Now, if let us just give an example, if you see the history of 
let us say uh, tall buildings. Now uh, Empire State Building in USA was built in 1903 and this was built in steel. So use of metals as much much before much before concrete has actually come use of metal has started in very high rise building. You one could not have built um, very many many you know many tall buildings in concrete or long span bridges invariably even today very long span bridges are steel bridges. The main main important here is this material unlike our uh, concrete or similar ceramic materials brittle ceramic materials they are weak in tension. So unlike them steel or the metals they are also strong in tension. So where you have large flexural load coming in and corresponding tensile strength metal was the only solution even today it is the um, most you know it, it is a solution in fact concrete you just cannot use alone you always used either with steel reinforcement or with uh, uh, pre stressing through steel uh, once in a while of course with the plastics but by and large it is the metal again. So therefore bridges civil engineering construction cannot be think of one cannot think of civil engineering construction without metals namely mainly of course the steel right. So therefore they find their use everywhere you can see also in rails and uh, 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 vehicles etc etc pipes and so on. So let us see what are the structure how does the structure of the metal look microstructure of the metal we are talking of the micro and the macro structure of the metal how does it looks and we have talked about metallic bond because we said the metal they form metallic bonds. Now what is it basically you see they have their outer electrons they can lose very easily right and this outer electron can form electron they can form electron cloud they can form electron cloud and this electron cloud is free to move through a three dimensional arrow of positively charged atoms under a small potential gradient and that is why they are good conductor of electricity. So their structure is basically they have the positively charged uh, cations and electron clouds which are actually free to move in this in the three dimensional layer of this positively charged atoms or cations and that is what is the basic metal structure is. This electron cloud also ensures the bond between this positive charges in the 3D array. So bond between this uh, uh, 3D array is also ensured by this electron cloud because they are positively charged and this negatively charged cloud together bonds this positively charged cations and that is what is a metallic bond. The metal atoms are considered as hard non deformable spheres packed together to have a sphere you know each pair is in contact with another sphere. So sphere in contact with adjacent spheres and forms an aggregate of aggregate of crystals or grains called space lattice. So metals basically you know they are considered as hard non deformable spheres this cations are hard non deformable spheres and they are packed together this one sphere is touching with the other one and you know each sphere is in touch in, in contact with the adjacent spheres and forms an aggregate or crystals or we call them grains. So these spheres put together they forms the crystal or the grain and this grain we call a space, space lattice. So in a space lattice they form uh, you will have you know several I mean this, this uh, 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 spheres which are basically nothing but cations which are closely packed and they are touching with each other and this ones forms an aggregate of crystals a set of crystals or grains and whole thing we call a space lattice right. So that is what is the metallic structures we, we take unit cells which are repeated large number of times. So unit cells are nothing but the arrangement of the arrangement of the arrangement of those uh, charged atoms right and these are repeated large number of times in any direction to generate the space lattice. So the space lattice actually has number of unit cells and each unit cells have got atoms spherical you know adjacent to each other touching each other. 
Right, there are four types of lattices that has been identified. Of course, the first one is not much, it is not in practical metal, it is never practically not seen, not much. These four types are simple cubic, body centered cubic, face centered cubic, and hexagonal closed packed. Right. So, this is BCC, FCC, and HCP. These are the three main type of uh, structures which we see. We will see them a little bit more in details in the next one. So, if you follow this metallic structure, a simple cubic primitive lattice would look like this. In this one, you have center of the spheres located, you know this is the unit cell which will be repeated several times to form the space lattice as we have said earlier and simple cubic type of, uh, simple cubic type of uh, unit cell will have 8 atoms at 8 corners, 8 atoms at 8 corners, they will have 8 atoms at 8 corners, right. And uh, one can very easily see, you know, this is the center of those center of those atoms, and because each atom is touching with each other, and this is the length of the cube. Now, since there are eight atoms, you know, this one eighth of each of the atom will be there in a unit cell, unit cell. So, one eighth of eight such cells. That means you'll have within this cell you'll have total volume of a single atom and this cube is of course, will its size would be equals to, you can find out its size and its size would be equals to, uh, you know, uh, uh, one can find out what is the volume of this unit cube correspondingly and uh, uh, this length will be equals to the diameter or 2 r and if you calculate out the void space or packing density, it will turn out to be 52 percent. It is basically quite a lot of voids in the system. Okay. So, uh, uh, in this one there are uh, one, this is body centered cubic, you have one center of one of the atom is here and there are eight more atoms and if you similarly calculate out their uh, packing density will be 68 percent. 68 percent is the uh, atom and um, 32 percent is a void space in this. So, this is what is, this is what is simple cubic and body centered cubic. Now, the other ones are face centered cubic and hexagonal close packed. Now, in face centered cubic, you have again 8 on the 8 corner and on each center of, you know, on each face there are 6 surfaces and on the center each surface center of one of the atoms lie. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, center of the 6, 6 atom or spheres lie onto the surfaces, 6 surfaces and in corners lies another 8 surfaces and if you calculate out which you shall do just try to find out if you calculate out its uh, uh, packing density will turn out to be 74 percent. Similarly, hexagonal closed packed system is something like this it has got you can as you can see you have got uh, in a hexagon at the base you have got 4 plus 3 7, 7, uh, uh, 7 center of 7 atoms lies here 3 lies there and again 7 lies up and one can calculate out what will be the packing density of any one of the system. We will just try to calculate for one of them. For example, if we calculate out for, if we calculate out for uh, the face centered cube, you can see that there are 8 corner, at, corner atoms and shared by 8 units. For example, this corner atom, it will be shared in 8 such units because these are the replicates, you know there is 8 such units. So, 1 8 is in this cube and in 8 such units you will have 1 8 of each of them. So, 1 8, 1 8, 1 8 and 1 8 of this one you know. So, there are 8 such units and it is shared each of this atom is shared in uh, atom is shared in 8 unit cells. So, 1 8 volume is here and you have got at the faces 6 faces there are 6 such 6 faces center of 
6 atoms lies. So, therefore, half of the volume of you know 6 atoms. So, total number of atoms would be 1 8 into 8, 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 1 8 into 8 plus half into 6 and that would make it 1 plus 3 equals to 4. So, the volume occupied volume of the atoms in volume of the atoms in 1 unit cell will be equals to 4 atoms 4 atoms and what is the side length of the unit cell this you can find out because if I take any one of this phase let us say a b a b e f a b e f phase if I take this is the phase which has got a you know is a sphere which is or atom which has got a center onto the phase itself. So, it will be something like this and this 1 eighth out of which 4 this one this one and this one they would look like this. So, therefore, this diagonal will equals to 2 r and if this diagonal is equals to 2 r then I can find out s square plus s square will be equals to 2 r square you know s square s square s square s square plus s square it will be equals to 2 r plus you know 4 r. So, it will be equals to 4 r. So, from this you can find out a a will be given as 4 r divided by under root 2 and then since you know a volume is nothing but a cube. So, a cube a cube is equals to 4 4 r by under root 2 whole thing cube that is the volume and there are 4 atoms which each atom actually will be 4 by 3 into pi you know or pi uh, r cube into 4. So, this divided by 4 r under root 2 cube this equals to 0 0.74 you know this equals to 0 0.74 as we are finding here. So, therefore, one can find out one can find out one can find out the packing density of such a system and for all other systems one can find out. So, we are not really interested in details of this packing density, but just as an example uh, it was thought that will give you this idea. So, this seems to be out of the four types simple cubic seems to be having maximum voids the least voids are with this and HCP least voids are the most closely packed systems are these two. Okay. So, metals are packed in this manner right. Now, how does this structure forms? We can see this. So, they are packed in this manner in their solid structure. Now, initially metals are always formed from the liquid structure. Initially, they will have you know they will be molten state when we are forming them and when they form actually they form into this kind of a structure from liquid to solid formation at certain locations this side of side type of structures will be formed. These structures we call as dendrite structures. So, from liquid to solid formation when it takes place this structure dendrite structure formation takes place and these dendrites have crucifix form a crucifix like form this is because latent heat is removed away along the closed packed direction because of the closed closely packed direction along the closed packed direction latent heat is removed they tend to form this sort of a crucifix structure right followed from this once such dendrites are formed this dendrites will be formed at several places you know. So, you will have several centers at which nucleations will take place and you will have dendrites here dendrites there and dendrites there. So, when in molten state because most metals we form from a molten state to a you know solid form. So, in this first step what happens in the liquid as we cool it down the dendrite formation will take place and this takes place in several places and followed from that is a followed from that is grains formation because when this dendrites are formed and more dendrites are formed because solidification takes place solid form because I said that when solidification takes place first it takes place, takes place in the shape of this dendrites and as further and further more of them form they actually form into solid grains and there will be dendrites and solid grains 
and many many places right so that is that would be the next third stage and then as cooling takes place it results in crystalline solid phase comprising of closed track grains different in orientation with discontinuity between adjacent grains at boundary. Let us see the figure, this will give us idea. So, when such grains are forming, solid grains would form and several such grains would form and this will result in crystalline phase which will have closed pack grains formation, but this grain formation since it has started at different places and forming in different way, there can be different differing orientation and different uh, you know different orientation and different crystalline orientation is possible and then there would be when they join up fully there will be discontinuity between this adjacent grains at their boundary. So, at their boundary there could be discontinuity because from somewhere this you know dendrites would have formed and then the solid grain formation started it continues to grow and it will have a given crystal orientation. Some other places you will have different crystal orientation and this forms so there will be some kind of grain boundary right within a grain boundary I have one type of crystalline structure in another kind of grain boundary I will have another kind of crystalline structure and all this makes it a polycrystalline structure. So, all this makes a polycrystalline structure. So, metal has actually crystalline structure which are formed because of the spheres closely spaced, spaced, spaced I mean closely packed uh, cation spheres which are in contact with each other they form the uh, they they you know form the space lattice after their you know or rather unit cells this unit cell repeated form the space lattice or grain or crystalline structures and these crystal structures they can be different in the metal and it is therefore polycrystalline so metal is therefore polycrystalline metal is therefore polycrystalline metal is polycrystalline right so metal is polycrystalline right now we talked of properties of the metal. So, just let us define or recall we might have mentioned this properties, but let us recall again the most important of course, the mechanical properties we are looking at and some of those mechanical properties let us define we might have already stated sometime in connection with the concrete and masonry let us re look at some of them. Now, we said that non metals are usually brittle. So, usually if you remember if you recall the stress chain curve of concrete or you know this will be a small portion, but mostly uh, brittle material pure brittle material will, be, will have a stress strain curve like this pure brittle material will have a stress strain curve like this right. Then, but this is elastic if you recall we discussed about this sometime, but a ductile material will have lot of deformation lot of deformation beyond its you know it will show a lot of deformation beyond this point what you can call this an ill point or something beyond this you will have lot of ductility. So, brittle elastic and ductile material that we have understood, but I think we talked about elastic material which is uh, you know if you release this stress it will come back to its original shape brittle material will simply fail somewhere here. So, usually the non metallic materials are of this kind, but metallic material many of them could show this sort of properties. So, you have a stress strain curve of course, some portion will have elastic beyond that you have a uh, uh, you have a portion where it of course, the ultimate strength is somewhere here, but it reaches finally fails at large strain. So, this defines the ductility, this defines the ductility, this line defines the ductility that is the deformation capacity. This area under this curve up to this A O B, we define it as resilience. Resilience is the energy it can absorb till elastic limit. This is an important property, particularly important for uh, railway sleepers or similar places where it would absorb a lot of energy and then when you release the stress it can it can come back to its original condition without any kind of permanent deformation. So, that is resilience resilience is that property and toughness is defined total area under this curve toughness is defined as a area under this curve stress strain curve which is the energy that it can actually withstand before failure total energy it can absorb strain energy it can absorb before failure. So, what we have seen ductility course many metals are elastic up to certain limit and then of course, it is ductile and then uh, uh, it has got high toughness and some amount of uh, resistance you know resilience also is there. So, these are the properties are important and we will look into this. 
Now all this property when you are looking at stress strain characteristics it relates to deformation and we have seen deformations of uh, uh, non-metallic materials, deformation of non-metallic materials. Now let us see deformation, what is the microstructure, how is the microstructure related to the deformation of uh, metallic materials. Process of deformation is modeled as the movement of dislocations, process of deformation in case of metal is uh, 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 modeled as the movement of dislocations which are actually line defects caused by mismatch in the atomic stacking in the metal lattice structure. Okay, these are basically line defects and caused by mismatch in the atomic stacking in the metal lattice structure. We shall see them some example something we will try to see. Dislocations, so basically, basically deformation is nothing but movements of dislocations and uh, uh, these are some sort of line defects and these are caused by mismatch of the atomic stacking in the metal lattice structure. So dislocations are defined as the boundaries between the slipped areas of a crystal and unslipped region. We will have some diagram to explain this better. So process of deformation is modeled as a movement of dislocation that is important. Let us see this diagram, this will make it clear. So progress of dislocation through a simple cubic lattice structure. Okay. Uh, now, you see this is we have taken a primitive lattice that is a simple cubic although as we said that rarely this is you know this is not a common uh, structure that is seen in metals but for explanation purpose this is pretty easy to explain. So you have, you have a slip region here you know this is a stresses around the slip region and you have a slip region here and this portion if you see it is unslipped. So these are your, uh, these are your atoms, these are your atoms, these are your atoms and there is a slip location. So this, this one, this one instead of like this being like this, it has become uh, something like this and this is what is a slip region, the stresses around the slip region and this slip region then further moved, slip region then further moves where these are unslip region and as you can see the slip region has increased, unslip region is here. And this slip region as it further increase, finally it gives rise to, uh, this, you know, come finally it gives rise to the deformation. So that is what it is, the progress of dislocation through a simple cubic lattice is shown. This is the stress region corresponding to this, now this is the stress region. Since the slip has moved there, this is the stress region and now the whole thing is something like this. So this shows the movement of dislocation, so dislocation takes place dislocation takes place, you know, dislocation takes place along what is known as slip planes, planes. So they are present, they are always present in a metal and they are formed by random way in which liquid metal atoms binds to the solid dendrite structure at the solid liquid boundary during solid, during solidification. So they are always present in a metal and are formed by random way in which liquid metal atoms bind to the solid dendrite structure at the solid liquid, solid liquid boundary during solidification. So while solidification this would be present because the random way in which the liquid when it is solidifying right the you know liquid metals are binding, liquid metal atoms bind this solid at the boundary that you know boundary of the dendrite structure that gives rise to this sort of dislocation. They can also be formed due to stresses. So they can be formed stresses and movements usually occur through what is known as slip planes. So movement occurs through slip planes. Therefore what we have understood deformation in metals is basically nothing but movement of the dislocations and dislocation do exist in the structure uh, always because of the formation, process of the formation itself and they can be also formed by stresses they can result in dislocation. So when these are present and you are loading there can be movement of this dislocation further you know causing deformations. Okay. So this is what is basic mechanism of deformation in metal structures. Okay. The details of this of course we are not going to look into but just in sort of introduction although we have taken the simple cubic lattice for example but this can occurs in any other kind of lattice but this is only for the purpose of explanation that the simple case was taken right. But the details are not really of uh, much of our interest.
uh, much of our interest at the moment. Now how do we strengthen the metal? Strength of metal depends upon its microstructure, microstructure also on composition, you know. How strength of metal would depend upon its microstructure, macrostructure and also on composition. Now, what is microstructure? Microstructure is the, uh, 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 the, the lattice, structure of the lattice itself, that is simple cubic or uh, face centered cubic etc. etc. Macrostructure is the polycrystalline structure which is there, overall polycrystalline structure. So, single crystal structure is the microstructure and there will be uh, in microstructure if you look at some position you will see single crystalline structure, some other case you will see some other crystalline structure, but when you look overall to the structure then it is polycrystalline. So, both this would actually govern the uh, uh, properties of the metal and also it depends upon the composition, also it depends upon the composition. Now, how we can, how can we actually strengthen? First thing we will see that effect of grain size. The grain sizes can, uh, uh, grain sizes, you know, strength would be governed by, is governed by grain size. It is governed also by alloying, we will see them. And uh, uh, intermediate second phase production, these are the ways which you can be. Then strain hardening. Uh, and then heat treatment. Now, we will look into the effect of grain size today, but these two are quite, we are quite familiar with this just as an example, we will discuss this of course sometime later in detail. This is quite familiar to us and this is also quite familiar to ours. Strain hardening is quite often used uh, in, in reinforcement bars, uh, in cold twisted deformed bars and uh, we will discuss this of course in details quite often used and so is heat treatment in, in thermomechanically treated reinforcement bars. So, we shall see this two effects sometime later on, but today of course, we will see the effect of grain size, we will see the effect of grain size. Okay. In a single grain, we have seen that atomic arrangement is regular and becomes irregular at the grain boundaries, because we have, we have seen that uh, 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 in a in, in you know the within within a grain boundary within the grain boundary it is the same crystal structure uh, that would be formed and uh, since they, there are different location at which the nucleation started or dendrite formation started you have crist different crystal orient orientation at different places so when overall solid formation takes place when overall solid formation takes place and they come and then they join each other. So, at the boundary you have change of the crystal structure. So, within a grain boundary you will have same type of crystal structure, you will have same type of crystal structure. And also we have seen that dislocations actually uh, takes place within the within the same type of crystal. So, as the crystal progresses, as the dislocation progresses it will get stuck at the boundary because uh, you know it will get stuck at the boundary because then you have a different grain structures. So, dislocation cannot progress beyond the boundary and it is of course a linear effect, it is not a planar effect, it is a linear effect in one dimensional effect and uh, along the slip planes it is just arrested at the grain boundary. Now, uh, higher number of dislocations one can find in larger size of grains, you know similar to what we said earlier also uh, defects are present in the if you remember when we talked about uh, uh, concrete or cement, we said the defects are present right in the beginning uh, in the uh, you know beginning in the material itself even before you have applied any load. And here also we know dislocations are uh, available right in the beginning itself because of the formation process itself. So, right in the beginning you have you can have dislocations present in the structure of the metal itself and uh, you know larger the size of the grain this would actually will have, this will have uh, more number of possibly more number of dislocations, possibly more number of dislocations, probability of finding more number of dislocations in a larger size grain is much more than finding in a smaller size grain. So, in a smaller size grain you have, you know assuming that that similar type of process of production of this uh, grain uh, product, you know similar type of production after all they are cooling and in the same process basically dislocations are formed. So, if you have a larger grain, you are likely to find more number of grains there, more number of dislocations there, whereas in a smaller grain, 
you are likely to find less number of dislocations. And then again the other effect is that as the grain as as this you know as the grain I mean within the grain boundary itself dislocation cannot progress. So, when you have smaller number of grain or smaller size of grains smaller size of grain number one you are likely to find out less number of dislocation within it and this dislocation cannot progress you know the critical stress it can only progress beyond a critical stress level and not I mean beyond a high stress level beyond before that it cannot progress. So, when you have smaller number of you know the fine grain size results in lower yield stress and then dislocates, dislocations are arrested earlier in a fine grain structure. So, this is this ensures that if you have finer grain size you will have more you will have if you have a finer grain size you will have more strength. So, this is been actually observed when yield stresses are compared with the grain boundary diameter, grain boundary diameter you know if you consider equivalent diameter grain boundary area and consider the equivalent diameter this axis it is this axis actually uh, root over under you know 1 by 1 by grain boundary diameter has been plotted 1 by under root uh, grain boundary diameter is plotted in millimeters and as this larger grains because this is 1 over diameter to the power half is plotted and on this side is the yield stress. So, it is this side as I go it I have smaller grains this side I go I have larger grains and you can see the yield stress for different metal for example, molybdenum it is somewhere here the steel it is here and zinc it is here aluminum alloy etc. So, when you have got smaller the grain size becomes smaller the yield stress increases with finer grain size the yield stress increases with finer grain size the yield stress increases right and this has been equated to a formula uh, the yield stress is a function of k d to the power minus half k d to the power minus half you know this is a linear graph as you can see. So, some sigma 0 plus k and this is a constant sigma 0 is of course, a constant again the intercept possibly onto the line and d to the power half. So, therefore, it shows that when I have a finer grain boundary when I have a finer grain structure the uh, yield stress is likely to be higher and in a coarser grain structure um, yield stress are likely to be lower. So, strength of the metal will be higher when I have a finer grain boundary structures. So, that is that is what is uh, uh, the effect of grain boundary uh, right. So, that is that is uh, you know the, the effect of other other effect like alloying effect the effect of uh, uh, intermediate phase alloy effect of heat treatment and strain hardening we shall look into the ne next class. Uh, now, some of this of course, we, uh, we are familiar we are quite familiar because strain hardening and heat treatment these are two familiar uh, phenomena we have seen and quite often we have used in uh, the reinforcement of the concrete structures. So, anyway this is what we will look into the next class uh, and then we will look into the iron car iron carbon system and uh, their applications to civil engineering structures right so what we have discussed today we have dis defined what are metals discuss something about the fundamentals of metals then we have tried to discuss uh, you know we have also discussed about the structures of the metal and also uh, what we mean by deformation you know uh, first we looked into the structures of the metal what are the possible structures as, as we have seen unlike uh, we have also looked into the microstructure of uh, ceramic materials like cement microstructure and here the metallic structures uh, which is which you know and we have looked into this. And uh, unlike those one where it was uh, basically van der Waals bond which are bonding the cementitious material which are pretty weak much weak and therefore, not very strong material the metallic bonds are much much stronger and therefore, you get quite high strength in tensile strength as well tensile properties are also much better and that is what we have looked through the microstructure the, through the metallic bond and also the you know like the metal, metal structure microstructure of the metal. Then we have tried to look into what is deformation what we you know the deformation as we understand uh, how it is governed by the microstructure and then lastly we have tried to look into we have named basically the strengthening mechanism that is uh, 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 that is uh, effect of grain size 
on the yield stress that means if you can improve the grain size you can make it finer grain size instead of a coarser grain size uh, that strength would be improved that is what we have seen and we have looked into other kind of grain sizes other kind of uh, strengthening uh, you know factors which can strengthen the uh, metal that is uh, uh, the alloying and uh, then the intermediate uh, phase uh, and then um, heat treatment also strain hardening. So, we look into those four in the subsequent classes. Thank you for hearing.